Good evening, everyone. We're going to uh, start at 7. Um, so if everyone could find their seats, and the next time you see me, we will be live streaming, and so we will start exactly at 7. Thank you for being here, and especially thank you for being early. Welcome, everyone, and thank you, even to our internet audience. We are just grateful and thankful that you're here. Welcome to a sacred conversation on race, violence, and human dignity. 
an evening with Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright, Jr. We have just a couple of uh, things that we really want you to be aware of. First is uh, we want to provide safety for each and every person in the audience, so we want you to be aware that in the unlikely event that a fire alarm sound, you should move to the nearest fire exits and exit the building. There are two exits upper. I want you to check out the, uh, the exit signs that are up so that you'll know just in case of an emergency, you can exit out of the doors. Finally, down here and down here are also exits. You can exit out of those as well. And when you exit out, we ask you if you know to leave outside, move away from the building until the all clear sound is given. While we do not think anything can happen, it is important that we're safe and we want you to be aware. So make sure you know where exits are and we ask you if anything happens, we ask you to please be calm. We also want to recognize we have some wonderful sponsors, uh, the Academy of Preaching and Celebration and CTS are uh, in partnership with some wonderful sponsors. First, our local PBS affiliate, WFYI, is uh, partnering with us tonight and we're thankful for them. The Desmond Tutu Center for Peace, Reconciliation and Global Justice is here tonight and you will be hearing from the executive director in just a moment. Uh, Elizabeth Meyer Bolton and the SALT Project, who produced the video, uh, they're here and we're thankful. And we're also thankful to Pastor Otis Moss and Trinity United Church of Christ for their help. Um, initially, uh, I was preaching there and saw the Ten Rules, and uh, it was very special. And I thought that we should come home and do something with it, and the team has been responsive, and we're thankful. We um, at Christian Theological Seminary um, would love uh, people who would like more information about us and what we do. Uh, we are sponsoring this conversation because we are very serious about race, about human dignity, about human respect. Our president, who you'll meet in just a few moments, uh, preached a wonderful sermon on white privilege because it's our desire, uh, as we say, to have a sacred conversation on race, violence, and human dignity. Also, we'll be showing uh, the design of tonight's program is we have so much heat and so little light that we have designed this program uh, for a kind of reflection time. You will see several videos and then we're gonna have a reflection time because uh, I believe that we have so much heat. Like I keep saying, I want less emotion in my news. You know, in other words, we throw around a lot of heat, but we don't have much light. So we've designed the program tonight for some critical times of reflection. Then we'll, uh, after Dr. Wright speaks, we'll show another video, the large video, and following that, we'll have some time of dialogue. Um, you'll be able to ask questions of Dr. Wright, and uh, we pray that this would be reflective time because we have so much heat and so little light in our culture because we have so little reflection and so much talking. Uh, so we're going to ask you. We're going to give you cards, and we're going to ask you to write uh, any questions that you may have on a card. And also, uh, we have, uh, you can tweet your uh, questions to hashtag 10 rules. You can tweet, we'll say more about that a little bit later. Also, following the event, it's our desire to improve our service as Christian Theological Seminary to you. And so we're gonna have an online survey that you can go uh, if you registered and we have your email, we're going to email you a survey. You'll be able to evaluate the events and, the, uh, and we have yesterday, tomorrow as well and each day, uh, whatever day you participate, you'll be able to evaluate. We'd love to hear your feedback, love to hear from you. And uh, we have um, some very special VIPs here, and uh, I would like for them to uh, stand. So I'm going to start with uh, Chief Rick Height, I believe, is here. Chief, is he here? Not yet coming? Okay. Uh, we have Elizabeth Meyer Bolton, who is, I'm going to have her stand. This embarrasses her, but I'm going to have her stand. Come on, stand, Liz. Please stand. You did so much to make this possible. <laughs> David Miller. Uh, coming soon. Uh, we'll introduce more at the end of the program. I want to introduce to you our president of our seminary, Matthew Meyer Bolton, and we're just uh, proud and pleased. Uh, he allows a tremendous amount of freedom, allows me to be free and our team to be free to plan these kind of events, and uh, we're grateful for his leadership, and we're thankful to have him as our president. And so I'd like for you to meet our president, President Matthew Meyer Bolton.
Well, thank you, Frank. And if you don't mind, let's uh, extend our thank you to Dr. Frank Thomas, who is really the visionary behind this evening. So welcome to Christian Theological Seminary. Uh, I want to say a special welcome to those of you who are watching from afar, online, the virtual audience, but also to those of you who are here. I often say that, welcome to Christian Theological Seminary, and I always mean it. But there's some nights when I mean it in a special way, and tonight is one of those nights. Uh, look at this room. I know that the internet audience is just as wonderfully diverse as this room is. We need to have sacred conversations about the issues that are pressing in our community life. What is a seminary? You may know the word means seed bed, the place where the seeds can grow. And for us, typically, the seeds are leaders, leaders of churches, leaders of community. If you are a leader, we want to connect with you and get you connected to Christian Theological Seminary. But the seeds are also often conversations, conversations like tonight, conversations that really define our life together as a community and as brothers and sisters. I serve on the board of an organization called Bread for the World. It's a Christian organization that is devoted to ending hunger in our lifetime. We have that opportunity, all of us in this room, we have the opportunity to end hunger in our lifetime. Today, actually, this morning was the second day of the March board meeting for Bread for the World, and I was at the board meeting in Washington, D.C. So we're in a high rise, looking out the window. You can see the Capitol building from the boardroom. The Capitol building has scaffolding all around it because it's being restored. In the middle of the boardroom meeting, we all stopped because an amazing sight was visible. All the traffic had stopped except for this particular avenue leading up to the Capitol. There were police officers, uh, a motorcade, motorcycles, several uh, black limousines. This was the motorcade for Prime Minister Netanyahu as he was approaching the Capitol. Now, many of you know what happened today, a speech to the joint session of Congress, great controversy, that controversy will now continue. But what happened wasn't so much about, as we looked out over the city in that boardroom, Bread for the World, right, the name of the organization. It wasn't so much about a, a nuclear weapons or Iran or Israel. It was just there was a sense that came through the room. There was a hush that came over the room. It was about just how much controversy we live in today between religions, between nations, between peoples. And somebody said, we're hungry for more than bread. We're hungry for shalom. We're hungry for peace. We're hungry for dialogue, even and especially when we disagree. And then the other thing that happened in the middle of the board meeting was we heard about the Justice Department report on Ferguson. Have you heard about that yet? So that, that report will come out tomorrow in full. But we know enough about it today to know that the Justice Department is making the claim, and it's a powerful claim, a powerful set of findings about constitutional violations of African-American brothers and sisters just a few hours from here. Now, what's so heartbreaking about it is that we all know and love and respect police officers. Somebody say amen. We all know and love and respect the police department, and we, at the same time, feel for our brothers and sisters, all of us, but some of us especially who are of color who feel understandably and realistically that they cannot get home safely. This is a conversation we have to have. Jesus doesn't turn away from controversy. He turns toward controversy but he does so with respect and civility. So that's what we wanna do at Christian Theological Seminary and I wanna invite all of you and thank you for being a part of this conversation. Let us have it in such a way that we are all seedlings in God's garden and we all grow a little bit because of the conversation today. That we all bloom a little bit because of the conversation today. There's scaffolding on the Capitol. God's not through with us yet. The union is getting more perfect, but only if we talk and listen and pray. 
So let us begin. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Langston Hughes said, let America be America again. Let it be the dream that it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain seeking a home where he himself is free. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great, strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme. That any man be crushed by one above. Oh, let America be America again. The land that never has been yet and yet must be. The land where everyone, 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 where everyone is free, even me. Steve Biko was a South African and founder of the Black Consciousness Movement. He was known for his famous slogan, Black is Beautiful. During his life, he fought in the struggle to free black South Africans from the evil system of apartheid. In 1977, at the age of 30, he was killed while in police custody. Steven Biko once wrote that the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. We must value ourselves. We must love ourselves, for we are beautiful. Number six, this is rule number six. I know it makes you mad when the police step on your kicks. They're nice, you're upset, feelings raging, you just wanna swing. Well, that's a big mistake and it's just plain me. Do not allow yourself to get so upset, police. Avoid having physical contact at all times with the police. But you're just reaching in to grab your ID, oh no. That's another thing that you should know. It's important to know how to protect yourself. Don't be afraid to ask for help. You and I know you mean no harm, but if the police feel somewhat alarmed, they'll react and it won't be pretty. So no sudden movements when stopped, do you hear me? It's okay to be nervous, you might even shake. That's natural, police's job is to intimidate. Another thing I will tell you so that you remain spotless is keep your hands up and out of your pocket. Sometimes the police will assume the worst in you and before having the chance to explain what you do, we're at your funeral saying, I really missed him or her. It could happen to the best of them. It's important to know how to protect yourself and always remember, do not be afraid to ask for help. In, out, camera, smile. One of the rules for the 10 rules of survival if stopped by the police is don't run even if you are afraid. This is my painting that I created. This is the face of fear. The color blue is one of the coldest colors and it reminds me of police sirens. You 
got to say, say, say only what you need to say. Why don't you do, do, do only what you need to do? You've got to choose, choose the right path to take. It's not your pride, but your life. Yeah, your life's at stake. I hate to have to tell you, but you gotta keep cool. Police, I'm in to help, but you have got to help you, too. Remember all your manners, all your sirs and thank yous. And if you feel like fighting, then I hope that you choose to stay in line. Keep kindly, be respectful. Even if they don't, you know you got to be careful. Because they are not here to give the benefit of the doubt. And anything you say and do, it can be used against you. So... Why don't you do, do, do only what you need to do? You've got to choose, choose the right path to take. It's not your pride, but your life. Yeah, your life's at stake. It's not your pride, but your life. Yeah, your life's at stake. Good evening. There is a bio of Dr. Jeremiah Wright in your program, and I refer you to read that. But let me just say what an enormous privilege it is for the Desmond Tutu Center to partner tonight with the Academy of Preaching and Celebration here at CTS under the leadership of Dr. Frank Thomas to bring Dr. Jeremiah Wright to our campus and to our city in this way, uh, and to this auditorium. I've known Jeremiah Wright for a long time now, and there are very few individuals for whom my admiration and trust and love have remained so consistent and so secure over the years. The man we have with us tonight is a gifted intellectual. He is a wonderful teacher. He is a mentor to so many in this country and across the world. He is an amazing preacher, and he is a humble child of God. He's a true prophet of God, this man. And when some who are in power hear his name, they tremble in their seats of power. Uh, he strikes fear into their heart because he speaks the truth of God to them wherever they are. Those are ever who are poor and oppressed and look to God for help in their distress, hear him gladly. In my part of the world, he is a great, admired figure, a man whom we respond to with great love. Uh, those who fear him have just about done everything to him that Jesus has warned us about. You go to the gospel and you read that list, everything has happened to Jeremiah Wright. Uh, but he has, through it all, remained steadfast, he has remained, I won't say fearless, but he has remained courageous, anchored in his love for his God and in his following of Jesus the Christ. Um, because he continues even now to speak truth to power. Jeremiah writes one of those people whose relationship with God is such that as he trembles, his soul trembles before God so that his knees need not have to tremble before anyone on this earth. We are so privileged 
to have you here, my friend and my brother. Um, please welcome Dr. Jeremiah Wright, who will speak to us in the next section. Help me sing that. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. Walk with me. While I'm on, while I'm on this pilgrim journey, pilgrim journey. I want Jesus, I want Jesus to walk with me, to walk with me. Come on, let's sing that together. Walk with me. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. Walk with me. Walk with me. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. Walk with me. While I'm on, while I'm on this pilgrim journey, pilgrim journey. I want Jesus. I want Jesus to walk with me. To walk with me. Of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. To President Meyer Bolton, Dr. Frank Thomas, Dr. Joyce Thomas, Dr. Alan Buzak, faculty member administration of Christian Theological Seminary, those who have made this night possible. When Dr. Thomas initially extended the invitation to me to join in with the seminary community in a public address open to the public, a presentation to the seminarians on black preaching, an invitation to preach tomorrow at the Wednesday morning worship service, and a digital recording with Dr. Thomas to add to the incredible and invaluable archive that he is building in the area of African American homiletical studies. I was excited about the invitation. I was excited for several reasons. First, I was excited because of my tremendous respect for this genius and giant of a man you are blessed to have in your midst, Reverend Dr. Frank Anthony Thomas. <laughs> to be invited by him to be a part of the important work he is doing was both an honor and humbling. To be with him and his partner in life, in love, in marriage, and in ministry, the Reverend Dr. Joyce Thomas, is an honor to be asked <laughs> by him to contribute to his work and to address such a critical theme was and is humbling. <clears throat> I was excited, secondly, because coming to Christian Theological Seminary meant being in the presence of dear, cherished, and loving friends, Dr. Alan Buzak, Elna Buzak, and their daughter, 
And every time I get the opportunity to be around such a combination of brilliance, integrity, commitment, and battle-scarred Christian authenticity, I consider it a blessing. Then I was excited because your theme challenged me to become a partner in conversation with a seminary community that was taking seriously the tough topics and ever-present issues of race, violence, and human dignity. Topics and issues many seminaries around the country avoid as they stick to more spiritual subjects and ignore the two-ton, 500-year-old gorilla sitting in the middle of the theological living room. <laughs> I was excited because here was a seminary taking on the issue of race, what Jim Wallace calls America's original sin, racism. I knew of the Bishop Tutu Center for Racial Reconciliation, Peace and Reconciliation, and I knew Dr. Buzak's role as its initial, in its initial stages. I was at Butler University when the Archbishop spoke at the inaugural service. As I shared with him before we began tonight, I heard your president, Dr. Meyer Bolton, saw him online preach about white privilege. And here I was being asked to become a part of that conversation as a black Christian man who grew up spending half my life as a youngster in a segregated South and the other half of my formative years in a desegregated Philadelphia with a segregated YMCA. Christian segregation up South. I was excited. Here was a seminary tackling the topic of violence in a country founded on violence, born in the womb of violence violence toward the Native Americans, and violence against enslaved Africans, nursed at the breasts of violence, violence at home, from reservations for the redskins through segregation for the blackskins, to annihilation of the non-combatant yellowskins at Nagasaki and Hiroshima, up through internment of the homeland yellow skins capped off with the lynchings and mass incarceration of black and brown skins, born in the womb of violence, nursed on the breasts of violence, branded by Dr. King as the number one purveyor of violence. And now with her nuclear stockpile, her drones, black ops, Navy SEALs, American snipers and militarized police in charge of global violence. Here was a seminary starting a conversation about violence. I was excited. A religious institution anxious to engage the hot button item of human dignity. When our Christian track record has been weighed and found wanting in the area of seeing, acknowledging, or embracing others as humans worthy of dignity. From the dehumanization, demonization, and commodification of black bodies through the misogyny of female bodies, to the spiritual, mental, and physical annihilation of LGBTQ bodies, defining the other as less than human, an abomination going straight to hell. Here was a religious institution about to engage the issue of human dignity. I was excited. Race, violence, and human dignity. It was gonna be on and popping. Going down like Freddie Haynes says, going down like faux flat tires. <laughs> and then the focus shifted. On the heels of one grand jury in Ferguson, Missouri, coached by a U.S. attorney acting as a defense attorney for Darren Wilson, admitting known perjury as testimony, on the heels of that grand jury's failure to indict a white police officer who murdered an unarmed black teenager, and on the heels of a second grand jury failing to indict the police officers videotaped murdering an unarmed Eric Garner in Staten Island, New York. Dr. Thomas visited Trinity United Church, as he said, in Chicago on the first Sunday of December. His creative genius, his collaboration with SALT, his work with the media, media ministry of Trinity United Church of Christ and the crafting of the brilliant use of social media to craft Get Home Safely and the powerful links, some of which you have seen, the theme and the focus shifted, y'all. 
The theme morphed from simply race, violence, and human dignity into get home safely. I was asked to shift from a formal lecture, and he said repeatedly, do not preach. You preach on Wednesday. <laughs> I was asked to shift from a formal lecture on the theme, race, violence, and human dignity, to a complimentary commentary on the new youth-oriented focus of get home safely. Even Amos Brown on Radio 1 said last week, next Tuesday, Dr. Wright will be addressing this all-important subject, get home safely. <laughs> Dr. Thomas sent me the hyperlink so I could see the talented work we saw Mariah in person tonight of these incredible young people who teamed with the 10-point plan Dr. Thomas saw and laid out and expanded. When he was in Chicago on the weekend, he spoke at Trinity, and I was impressed. These young people are the bomb. But my excitement turned to anxiety. And it turned to anxiety for two primary reasons. I want to preface my explanation and conclude my presentation with a prophetic lament penned by a brilliant, beautiful black professor at Princeton Seminary one week before Get Home Safely was born, one week before the 10-point plan to preserve young lives was published. Dr. Yolanda Pierce wrote this lament at the end of November during the season of Thanksgiving. Dr. Pierce wrote, let us not rush to the language of healing before understanding the fullness of the injury and the depths of the wound. Let us not rush to offer a Band-Aid when the gaping wound requires surgery and complete reconstruction. Let us not offer false equivalencies, thereby diminishing the particular pain being felt in a particular circumstance in a particular historical moment. Let us not speak of reconciliation without speaking of reparations and restoration or how we can repair the breach and how we can restore the loss. Let us not rush past the loss of this mother's child, this father's child, someone's beloved son. Let us not value property over people. Let us not protect material objects while human lives hang in the balance. Let us not value a false peace over a righteous justice. Let us not be afraid to sit with the ugliness, the messiness, and the pain that is life in community together. Let us not offer cliches to the grieving, those whose hearts are being torn asunder. Instead, let us mourn black and brown men and women, those killed extrajudicially every 28 hours. Let us lament the loss of a teenager dead at the hands of a police officer who described him as a demon. Let us weep at a criminal justice system which is neither blind nor just. Let us call for the mourning men and the wailing women, those willing to rend their garments of privilege and ease and sit in the ashes of this nation's original sin. Let us be silent when we don't know what to say. Let us be humble and listen to the pain, rage, and grief pouring from the lips of our neighbors and friends. Let us decrease so that our brothers and sisters who live on the underside of history may increase. Let us pray with our eyes open and our feet planted firmly on the ground. Let us listen to the shattering glass and let us smell the purifying fires for it is the language of the unheard. God, in your mercy, show me my own complicity in injustice. Convict me for my indifference. Forgive me when I have remained silent Equip me with a zeal for righteousness. Never let me grow accustomed or acclimated to unrighteousness. 
The first reason my excitement turned to anxiety can probably be attributed to my age and my friendship with members of the Association of Black Psychologists. Black men in my age group were socialized, especially black men with parents born in and raised in the segregated South of the first half of the 20th century when lynching of black bodies was at its zenith. Remember, Emma Till and I are just a few months apart in age. We were socialized to dissemble if it meant staying alive. Lower your eyes when you're talking to a white man. And don't you ever dare look a white woman in her eyes. My mother and father used to say they lynched black boys and black men for careless and reckless eyeballing. Remember what happened to Emmett Till? Don't act arrogant, haughty. Don't be uppity with white folks. Do whatever you have to do to show the man that you are not a threat. If he feels threatened by you, you are dead. There's a great deal of discussion in 2015 about corporal punishment and the drastic differences between child rearing practices in different ethnic communities. Some say don't hit. Some say whip they butt. <laughs> Some say spare the rod, spoil the child. There are even differences between black psychologists. Some say it causes emotional and even psychological trauma, which is hard to get over, if ever. Others, like Dr. Ruth Hare, say, go ahead, go ahead, call Children and Family Services on me <laughs> if you want to. But while you are calling on me, make two more calls for you, one for the police to arrest me, the other for the undertaker to come get you. <laughs> Spanking, whipping, with time out, you're going to get knocked out. <laughs> Three of the top 10 sayings in the black community, almost every black person over the age of 50 can finish. Keep on and I'm going to knock you into the middle. <laughs> I brought you in this world. We had a comedian come to our married couples ministry for entertainment one year, and as he listed those 10, he got down to this one. He said, boy, keep on. I'm going to beat all the black. He said, I used to wonder what kind of beating <laughs> that was until I went to Trinity Church and saw Reverend Wright. He said, he must have been a bad little boy. He said, and some of y'all need to stop laughing because you purple. I know y'all were perfect children. <laughs> the current discussion about corporal punishment has its roots in the way African children were and still are socialized with the experience and reality of child rearing for African Americans Given the history of chattel slavery and the brutal, if not fatal, consequences for black insubordination towards white blacks who didn't stay in their place, we're talking about a 300-year history of knowing your place and facing drastic consequences if you don't stay in your place. Cultural anthropologists, the Association of Black Psychologists, and the National Association of Black Social Workers will tell you as will a reading of the Works Project Administration slave narratives. Some enslaved parents beat their boys to save them from a much more terrible, if not fatal, beating from the overseer, the slave driver, or the slave master. Socialization taught, go along to get along. Don't make waves. Don't talk back. Say, yes, a boss, yes, a ma'am. And don't act too big for your britches. Black boys were socialized in a toxic environment, and a part of my anxiety is caused by the familiar sound of the same kind of lessons being taught to the targets of police authority, militarized police threats, and white privilege, white racism, and white perceptions, no longer hidden under a white robe, but now shown openly behind a tin badge and full military armor. And while preserving and protecting unarmed, innocent black and brown lives, young and old is crucial for me and for us 
The way I look at it, that is only half of the solution. Lonnie Guineer and her awesome insights in her book, The Miner's Canary, points to what I see as the other half of the solution. And I hope in honor and respect of Dr. Thomas and his work that this is not heat but light. The second reason for my anxiety is I am not sure how many of us in the comfort of a seminary community are willing to take the much needed steps to move our society toward engaging the other half of the solution? In Lonnie Guineer's book, The Miner's Canary, she argues, and I would say she argues accurately, that the miner's canary, now for urban, metropolitan, suburban, exurban, condominium, living, timeshare owning, gentrified, adjusted, and even hip hop aficionado persons, most of us here have no clue what a miner's canary is. So let me quickly explain. From the coal mines in Bluefield, West Virginia, to the gold mines in Bloemfontein, South Africa, when the men and sometimes the women who work in the mines have to go way beneath the surface of the earth or go deep into the cavernous recessions and recesses of mile-high mountains, they take with them a canary, and they tie the canary's leg to a peg, a pole, or a rock right beside them as they are working. The miners hack deeper and deeper into the Earth's bosom in search of ores and minerals that will make somebody else rich. The canary is trapped deep in the mines alongside the miners, tied to a peg unable to fly away to safety, stuck in a place that is not his natural habitat, taken there against his or her will and held captive there by the ones who took him away from his home. While the workers take their razor sharp instruments and gouge out the guts of Mother Earth, they glance over every few seconds to see how the canary is doing. The canary can sing, but the canary cannot soar away to freedom. The miners keep watching the canary because the canary is the miners' early warning system. Those sharp instruments, those dangerous instruments, the tools the miner uses may dislodge some dangerous fumes, may set free some toxic gases, may unearth literally some noxious and highly combustible gas that human nostrils cannot detect. The canary knows when the miner may never know if it wasn't for the canary. The canary's cardiopulmonary vascular system is much more sensitive to danger than the miner's. And if the miner sees the canary keel over, unconscious or dead, the miners get out of that place immediately, no questions asked, no hesitation. Lonnie Guineer argues quite accurately that in America, the miner's canary is the black man, the black woman, black teenagers, and the black family, trapped like the canary in the mine, deep in the mine alongside the workers, tied to a peg of poverty, unable to fly, locked into a place of healthcare disparities, wealth gap disparities, and disparities of opportunity, stuck in a place that is not their natural habitat, unable to soar, but they can sing. Taken to that place against his own or her own will and held captive there by the workers who are making the owners rich by their hard work. And when the canary gets in distress, keels over or dies, the canary is labeled as pathological. The canary is deemed to be dysfunctional. Books, dissertations are written about the canary. And government-funded commissions analyze the canary. Gerna Myrdal, a foreigner, becomes an authority of the American dilemma caused by canaries. Moynihan studies the negative deficit model of canaries raised in maternal cages, matriarchal. The bell curve says canaries are genetically, biologically inferior. That's why they can never fly out of the mines in which they are trapped. 
Even African descended fatherless separation anxiety government officials start national initiatives to help canaries pull their pants up, to help canaries tie their shoes, to help canaries take responsibility for their families, to help canaries become birds with two parents in the cage. Initiatives and programs to teach the canary how to survive in a toxic environment becomes famous or get funded or get funded and then become famous. Plans are put in place to teach the canary how to stay in his place. Programs are started to address canary on canary crime <laughs> and stop canary violence with gangs of canaries preying on innocent canaries. All the focus is on the canary to such an extent that almost nobody stops to say, hey, ain't nothing wrong with the canary. We're busy trying to fix the canary, and what we need to do is fix the atmosphere that's killing the canary. We need to fix the systems that are causing the conditions. We need to teach black and brown youth how to negotiate safely the militarized mindset of American snipers in blue uniforms, but simultaneously, we need to fix the systems, change the environment, get rid of the toxic fumes in the atmosphere so that the canaries can breathe. I can't breathe. It's not only Eric Gardner's legacy to the hashtag Black Lives Matter movement. I can't breathe. There's also the canaries cry for the church and our society to take seriously the plea for human dignity. We need to challenge the status quo and this military mindset from a militarized metal detector school system to a militarized murderous criminal justice system, we need to change what Michelle Alexander describes as the law and order thinking, which translates into us versus them. White folks are the law, y'all are out of order. In the criminal justice system, sexually based offenses are considered especially heinous. In New York City, the dedicated detectives who investigate these vicious felonies are members of an elite squad <laughs> known as the Special Victims Unit. These are their stories. Bloom, bloom. <laughs> we need to seriously challenge or change the way things are. And to seriously do that, we cannot accomplish that with watered down statements of solidarity. It will take invasive, disrupting, nonviolent, peaceful, civil disobedience protests, which disrupt business as usual and call for a new business agenda, a radically new business agenda. What does that agenda look like? Walter Brueggemann says, finally comes the poet. Walter Brueggemann says, all true prophets are poets, so finally, let us hear again the lament, the lament lamentations of our modern day prophet whose penetrating poetry points us toward the radical, transformative human community where all human beings are seen as made in the image of God. The politicians and the pragmatists of the government say in the wake of two egregious grand jury's decisions not to indict, they say, let the healing begin. But the prophet of God says there are some who are not ready for healing. Let us hear her words again. Let us not rush to the language of healing before understanding the fullness of the injury and the depth of the wound. Let us not rush to offer a Band-Aid when the gaping wound requires surgery and complete reconstruction. Let us not offer false equivalencies, thereby diminishing the particular pain being felt at a particular circumstances in a particular historical moment. Let us not speak of reconciliation without speaking of reparations and restoration, or how we can repair the breach and how we can restore the loss. Let us not rush past the loss of this mother's child, this father's child, someone's beloved son, let us not value property over people. Let us not protect material objects while human lives hang in the balance. Let us not value a false peace over a righteous justice. Let us not be afraid to sit with the ugliness, the messiness, and the pain 
that is life in community together. Let us not offer cliches to the grieving, those whose hearts are being torn asunder. Instead, let us mourn black and brown men and women, those killed extrajudicially every 28 hours. Let us lament the loss of a teenager dead at the hands of a police officer who described him as a demon. Let us weep at a criminal justice system which is neither blind nor just. Let us call for the mourning men and the wailing women, those willing to rend their garments of privilege and ease and sit in the ashes of this nation's original sin. Let us be silent when we don't know what to say. Let us be humble and listen to the pain, the rage, and the grief pouring from the lips of our neighbors and friends. Let us decrease so that our brothers and sisters who live on the underside of history may increase. Let us pray with our eyes wide open and our feet planted firmly on the ground. Let us listen to the shattering glass and let us smell the purifying fires for it is the language of the unheard. God, in your mercy, show me my own complicity in injustice. Convict me for my indifference. Forgive me when I have remained silent. Equip me with a zeal for righteousness. Never let me grow accustomed or acclimated to unrighteousness. Dr. Yolanda Pierce, November 25th, 2014. Ten rules. Ten rules. Ten rules. Ten rules of survival. Ten rules of survival if stopped by the police. Number one, be polite and respectful when stopped by the police. Be polite. Be respectful. Remember that your goal is to get home safely. Your goal is to get home safely. Your goal is to get home safely. I'm sorry. Number two. If you feel your rights have been violated, you and your parents have a right to file a formal complaint with your local police jurisdiction. Number three, do not, under any circumstances, get in an argument with the police. Number four, always remember that anything you say or do can be used against you in court. Number five, keep your hands in plain sight. Make sure the police can see your hands at all times. Number six, avoid physical contact with police officers. Do not make any sudden movements and keep your hands out of your pockets. Number seven, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not run, even if you are afraid. Even if you are afraid. Number eight, even if you believe you are innocent, do not resist arrest. Number nine, if you are arrested, do not make any statements about the incident until you are able to meet with a lawyer or public defender. Number 10, stay calm and remain in control. Watch your words. Watch your body language. Watch your emotions. Remember. Remember. Remember, your goal is to get home safely. Get home safely. We want to ask you um, to write questions. You can send them across tweets at hashtag 10 rules. And we want to have um, just a couple minutes of reflection upon what we've heard. Remember, our goal is always light and not heat. And when we speak before we reflect, often we contribute to the heat and not the light. So we're going to have just a couple minutes. If you would like to uh, write a question or a comment, you can hashtag it. I believe they're cards. Uh, do you all have? They're on the end of your row. And if you're across the internet, you can tweet your question at hashtag 10 rules, hashtag T-E-N 
R-U-L-E-S. It's on the screen uh, behind me. And so before we speak, we're going to have Dr. Wright come back. And we're going to ask and have some time of dialogue and questions. But we don't want dialogue without reflection. So let's take just a couple minutes uh, as we get ourselves situated. If you would, if you have a question, if you will uh, send it to the end of the row, we will have someone to pick it up. And we'll have a couple of chairs to come out for Dr. Wright and I. All right. If you have a white Ford 724FDS, <laughs> gold Toyota Camry, VSH336, you're blocking somebody and a tow truck is circling the neighborhood. We ask you to um, we're coming with chairs. So that you all enjoy Dr. Wright tonight. Yeah, yeah. All right, I have um, my, my iPad over here, and I will be getting questions from the internet on this iPad. Dr. Wright? While we're getting situated, of course, of course, I've listened to you uh, preach and teach for many, many, many years. And um, there is a tone in your preaching and teaching now that I'd like for you to respond to. And it would be, there is a, um, a father even much deeper than before. You've always had a father. There is a father tone in your teaching, your preaching, your speaking. So could you comment on that while we're getting all our questions and getting everything set up? That's just my reflection. So you, you know, this is a sacred conversation, so you can disagree if you would like. I guess being a father and a grandfather um, is a part of what brings about that tone. Um, are they recording this? And then I have to edit what I say. <laughs> uh, the, uh, with the Sunday that you, that you were with us uh, during the altar call, when um, Pastor Moss asked us to share with our neighbors a prayer concern, I shocked poor Reverend White out of his white communion robe. He handed me his hand thinking I was going to say something simple or something, you know, my aunt, my cousin, my sister. And I said, pray for my daughter and my granddaughter because the millennials their age don't give a damn about church. His eyes got big. <laughs> We're in worship. <laughs> um, and knowing the, the ongoing dialogue with my youngest child and grandchild and, and young people their age, the millennials who have, have given up on the church between preachers of LA, preachers of Detroit, and, uh, <laughs> that I have to be more fatherly <laughs> in my tone as I try. Again, you know, heat doesn't get very far. They, they, they'll shut you down. They shut me down if, if, if I come off harshly. And, and uh, the things, exciting things that they've taught me, particularly Jamila, in terms of, of um, the difference between my age now as an old man and her age as a young woman. Um, I often ask her to critique my sermons. And I preached a sermon on uh, First Kings 19 uh, in Seasons of Distress, was where, where uh, Elijah was distressed. He was in distress. He was stressed out. First Kings 19, verse 1 says, when Jezebel found out what he had done, she put a hit out on him. And 
I mean, stop and step back for a moment. This is the commander in chief of the armed forces of the United States of Israel putting a head out on one man. I mean, it's like having a Tuesday morning kill meeting in, in the war room on the Potomac River where you decide who you're going to kill this week. Jamila said, Daddy, those, are, those analogies and metaphors are beautiful, but people my age don't know what you're talking about. We watch scandal. We don't understand nothing about it. <laughs> <laughs> so try to get more fatherly in terms of you can't correct if you can't connect. Trying to connect with, with, uh, with that, that generation is probably one of the reasons why you hear that tone more so now than 10, 15 years ago. So wh why would you say that the millennials don't care much for the church? They have told me they've made it plain <laughs> and clear. Um, what's the point? What's the point is their question. I mean, you, you worship, you praise, you say hallelujah, don't nothing change. What y'all going to do to bring about some change? Nothing. They have, you, got, you got, in fact, during the Ferguson, uh, from August up until present day, the social media that they're a part of, that social media network, was showing them a reality that the news media, corporate owned news media was not showing. And for them to hear what the news media is saying, for them to be there in person on the ground and, and back and forth with each other in terms of tweeting as, as well as videos taping what was actually going on, and then to hear the church take a stance that we must, we must these things take time. Let's, let's, um, that didn't happen in Soweto. That, that, that didn't happen to young people in South Africa. That didn't happen back in the movement. Um, it would mean take time. How much time is it going to take? And to hear those pronouncements from clergy right there in Chicago, you saw a part of it. A group of black and white clergy persons had their members go out into the street and lie down in the middle of the intersection for this, I think it was four minutes that it took Eric Garner to die, to just stop traffic. Other churches marched on the sidewalk because they didn't want to get in trouble with the police. And they say, these are churches, that's what the church, that's, you call this church doing something about it? that kind of really seriously attitude uh, that they articulate over and over again to me makes them lose faith in, in the church. We have a question um, on, from the internet. Um, how do we increase the dialogue amongst law enforcement and the community? Um, one, one example is what you're doing tonight. You, you, you announced some police officers present, some officials, having them in the same room in a, in a, in a context of conversation, not confrontation. Um, to have, I was trying to remember where I was, where they had a, at the church, oh, in Los Angeles, uh, two AME pastors had the chief of police the state police, the highway, California High, Highway Patrol, FBI, not just to come speak and speak at the folk in the congregation, but to talk with them, to meet and dialogue with them, and to hear, they could hear each other. Um, that, that's one way of doing it that I've seen work. Another question from the internet. What is the most important thing the traditional white church can do to educate its members on racism? Start with buying the tape of Meyer, President, President's sermon on white privilege, <laughs> playing it in every Bible class, every worship service. <laughs> <laughs> um, engaging that difficult, that difficult decision of uh, discussion, pardon me, with their members that he raised so powerfully in his message uh, to make them look, not feeling on the attack, uh, that they are being attacked or put down but to raise for them issues they never even considered. Uh, it's like, my people didn't hold any slaves. I didn't know, what are you talking about? Uh, what do you mean white privilege? Well, explaining it, again, calmly explaining it to, to get people to open their eyes and see things that they never considered, as he did so powerfully in that message. Um, we're gonna ask the internet to keep the, um, the tweets coming. We're gonna go inside the house. Why does economic justice elude the conversation Regarding, regarding the quality of life of black people. Elude the conversation. 
why, why don't we, I guess, why don't we talk more about economic justice? I, my response to that question would be tied to Jim Wallace's um, diagnosis of America's original sin, that to confess my sin means to repent, and to repent means to repay. We ain't going down that road. Now, when it comes to African Americans, so there gonna be no economic justice. You you talking about repaying, giving back, paying back? That 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 conversation is avoided like the plague. Here's a question, Dr. Wright. I'm curious to know what to do when you have followed the ten rules and someone ends up dead at the hands of the police. Anyway, what do you do then? I think at that point. I would ask the police officers, legal, legal recourse is about the only thing you can do with, with, at that point in terms of um, getting legal representation, having all the facts and, and presenting those facts. And I hesitated because it depends on the venue in which you're presenting. Don't present them in Ferguson. <laughs> <laughs> um, pre presenting them, get a change of venue if necessary to present them in a court where you can get a fair hearing in, in terms of what happened. This question says, how can we hold our community accountable? In many, many, many ways, um, and at many different levels. And I'm hesitating because when you say our community, a lot of our churches, some represented in this room, do not sit in communities where we live. And there's no investment by the members in that community, because that's not their community. They drive in, they drive out. Um, but so when you say our community, on one level, well, let me start. Let me start with the, with a personal personal level that many of us never even thought thought about. I had a I had a gangbanger say something to me that really brought me up short. My God. Janet's 50, so this would be 30 years ago, 33, 34, 35 years ago, when our firstborn was coming home from school. She went in Chicago, she went to Percy L. Julian, she and her boyfriend, she was in 10th grade, he was in 11th grade, changing buses at 103rd and, and Halstead in front of that fancy French restaurant, Jacques and Z-Box. Um, <laughs> she, she, got, she got held up at gunpoint. And she called me at the church and said, Daddy, I just got robbed. And I'm freaking. I'm getting ready to jump in the car. She said, no, 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 no. It was GDs. I said, and what is that? She said, they got, how do you know it was GDs? John, her boyfriend, later her husband, didn't throw the right sign in response. They took his earring. They took his chains. She said, they got my pocketbook. They got my driver's license. They got my house keys. But I'm going to get my stuff back. You don't have to worry. I said, wait a minute. How are you going to get your stuff back? And she called the name of my next door neighbor. She said, he's a GD. So what did you say? <laughs> she said, he's a TD. He'll, he'll get it for me. For, from then until 7 o'clock that night, I'm trying to figure out, I have a gangster disciple living next door to me. <laughs> and she called back at 7 o'clock proud. She said, I got my stuff with an apology. <laughs> I said, an apology? She said, yeah. They, they said, we didn't know you were the Rev's daughter. I said, they know me. She said, yeah, why do you think our church hadn't been tagged? There ain't no use. So I went next door to talk to him. That was when she was in 10th grade. And he said to me, you preachers preach about gangbangers, but you never talk to us. Oh How do we hold our kids? One way is to talk to our young people face to face. We know our, our kids, if you don't, I don't mean you personally, but an adult parent doesn't know, your kids know who's in the gang. One way of holding them is, is to talk to them and Another example, in terms of, just in terms of holding our kin, the, the names are legion in terms of ways of holding, make, make, holding our, our community accountable and doing some positive things in our community. One, one, one of the clergy persons whose praises I sing all over this nation is Father Michael Flager. Father Michael Flager did this, preachers, any preachers in the room, I challenge you to try it. Ask the brothers in your, in your congregation, uh, how much do the ladies of the night make in your neighborhood near your church? Buzak is laughing. <laughs> if they know, you're going to ask them how you know. 
Well, he found out what they made. And $100 an hour, he went out on the street and they gathered around 55 prostitutes and gave him $200 to talk to them for two hours. Not to give them the plan of salvation, say, you know, you're going to hell, to, no, no. But to tell, why are you doing this? And they found out some are doing this because they, they got kids to feed. They got rent to pay. They have no job. They have no skills. They have no, get them in GD. He's gotten about 30 of them in GD classes off the street. Some, and talking again, I said it happens on several levels, talking to black business persons and white to provide a job. The church will vouch for this person. If anything comes up missing, the church is going to take care of it. To team up persons who are on the underside with persons who can make a difference in their lives, that kind of, that kind of interaction um, are ways that I've seen work in terms of how we hold our community accountable, how we help our community become interested in the community. Changing miss the missionary mentality of we have a mission to these poor people to we have a ministry with. How about making them poor people your members? <laughs> We have a question. Uh, what are the 10 rules for white people? <laughs> Was that a tweet? <laughs> Stop assuming all blacks are guilty. Um, the associate, and you're talking about how serious this conversation is and the unpacking of layers. Khalil Gibran Muhammad's book, The Condemnation of Blackness, shows how the field of sociology in the 19th century determined how likely a person was to commit a crime by how dark they were. The darker you are, the more likely you are to commit a crime. Now that's sociology, that's the field of sociology. All right. So the social programs were set up for the Irish immigrants and the Polish immigrants and the Italian immigrants. When blacks came up in the great migrant, no social programs because they were criminals. They were defined as criminals. To stop seeing, let's go back to human dignity. One of the problems, I had this great lecture all prepared for you and you switched gears on me. My lecture would have been tonight. And it pertains to the, this question in terms of what, one of the rules for, for white people. Hashtag, did black lives ever matter? Because when you look at what happened in terms of the demon, Yolanda Pierce said he was, he was a demon. That's what Darrell Wilson, that's his language. When you make somebody a demon and take them out of the human community, when you dehumanize them, you commodify them. And we've been commodified since chattel slavery started to get people, whites to see not, not as something property which we're defined as in the, in the Constitution. You're not property, you're a person. To, and to see other people of different colors as persons, another rule for white people, understand that different does not mean deficient. Mm -hmm. okay. This question says, what Bible verses or story do you think is most illuminating for our times as we grapple with issues of race, violence, and human dignity? The Book of Judges. Everybody did what they wanted to. <laughs> I, 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 would, I would, in fact, I'm going to try to preach about this tomorrow. How much time do I have to preach tomorrow? Tomorrow. I'll tell you that in private. Tell me that in private. <laughs> um, in, terms of, in, terms of, in terms of the response that Jesus gave to the expert in the law, love, what's the greatest law? Love the what do I do to inherit eternal life? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the most important verse. If we don't love neighbor, many of us don't love self. What advice do you give to a young preacher in a small interracial church um, talking about issues on the surface level to keep from hurting feelings? I found out that, that um, much more in-depth conversation in, in the congregational level, parish level, can take place in Bible classes than it can in the, from the pulpit. There's no chance for feedback. There's no chance for, for co conversation. There's no, no chance for clarification. And, and I would advise that young pastor in terms of his or her Bible classes to study, I mean, to do some serious Bible study of, of issues 
uh, like Ezra. <laughs> you ever read the book of Ezra? Where it says, if your wife ain't a Jew, kill her. Let's talk, about, let's talk about the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, starting in Joshua. Let's, let's talk about some serious stuff in terms of where, where, why do Jews hate Samaritans? Bible class. To get them to see that some of, our, some of our stuff is not as new as we think it is when it comes to labeling other people. And I found that, that that helps more to, in a congregational level in terms of engaging members in study serious Bible study than, than trying to preach about those things. Are there any legislative changes that Dr. Wright might suggest to change the atmosphere for canaries? You got a couple of days? <laughs> yeah, if you read, uh, Michelle Alexander lays out a blueprint, bl blueprint in her, the new Jim Crow, uh, in terms of the legislative changes um, let me ask this question. Whom did the 13th Amendment free? The 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Anybody? This is a seminary, right? <laughs> who, got, who got freed in the, th by, in the 13th Amendment? Southern slaves? All the slaves, except prisoners. And as we sit here tonight, prisoners are still slaves. They have no rights. That's one legislative change right there. Banning the box. Um, not making persons who have, well, let's, let's undo criminal, let's undo legislatively what President Clinton did to us. We always trying to blame Republicans. President, President Clinton with that three strikes you're out. Look, Michelle points out that one of her clients stole a transistor radio, or a 10-speed bike, and got caught with three joints in his pocket. 10-speed bike, transistor radio, three joints. He's doing life without the possibility of parole. Changing, changing laws like that is yet another way. Seeing persons who have committed an offense, who have rehabilitated themselves as persons coming back into the community, not as recidivism and privatization of prison to get more money. Let's, we give it, changing the legislation that did away with education in prisons and giving prisoners some education. I mean, we beaming all this other stuff into them. Let's beam some classes on computers. And <laughs> we want to mention to our internet audience that the hashtag is 10 rules, T-E-N-R-U-L-E-S. Um, please continue to tweet us. Uh, what e did you not say in the message, or if you'd have had more time, you would have emphasized more in the message you just delivered? The um, I'll go back to my original, <laughs> my original, my original le lecture with a PowerPoint. I had a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> um, to un to unpack to unpack the set in stone kinds of notions and persons heads in this environment in this toxic environment as to who blacks are you're talking about enlightenment you're talking about voltaire you're talking about hume you're talking about kant immanuel kant you're talking about george wilhelm friedrich, friedrich hegel you're talking about thomas jefferson now you're talking about the church preaching the ham doctrine that, that blacks are confined to forever to be second-class citizens. You're talking about what's happening right now as we sit here tonight with this National Baptist group of somethings going up against, trying to, trying to, trying to decredit Forrest Harris and ABC College because they invited a lesbian woman to, pre to preach there. That kind of, that kind of drawing lines in the sand, the Bible is the inerrant world. Oh, oh, that didn't, black folk didn't come up with that. White folk came up with that. And we parroting them and following right behind them. The Southern Baptists, yes, they finally apologized for slavery, but they say women's got to stay in their place. <laughs> All right, so I would have talked about that when it comes to race and when it comes to violence. We, violence, we were talking black on black crime. Well, there's more white on white crime, but we don't talk about that. All right, in terms of violence, how are you gonna stop violence when you got a 
militarized police force. You mean I don't want you to be violent, <laughs> but I am going to keep on being violent. I would have talked about how deep that, that mentality, this is John Wayne, this is America, and we didn't even mention, before you get to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, let's talk about the Native Americans. You gonna give their country back? Do you know he's Khoisan? Do you know that, you know, I know you know. We took that country from them people just like we took this country from the Natives over here. Let's talk about that kind of violence. Are you non-violent? That's what, that's, that's what the, in the negotiated settlement in South, South Africa when apartheid was over, the, the Dutch Africaner wanted to make sure that the ANC and black people were non-violent. You've been violent for them. <laughs> I would have talked about those things at a much deeper level in terms of why is it that race, the problem of race clings to us like this? Why is it that violence is a part of our mentality? I left Fresno State University yesterday, I left this morning. I'm driving down the road, there's a street, rod and gun. The NRA, I mean, this is, this is John Wayne's land of America. <laughs> that, that you cannot afford human dignity to another human being that you don't think is a human. I would have talked much more about those things. How that came to be it just didn't happen um, this question asks: how do you suggest we keep the conversation going engaging young people well I would start with asking them their opinions get, finding out what they think and what they feel and not telling them what, what we think they should feel uh, to try that's why my education coming from my granddaughter and my daughter is hearing and listening to them um, I think when they, when they find out we're really going to listen and that they do have something to say, that's, that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is for us old, old heads to learn the difference between corporate hip hop and Cool Mo D, KRS One, Salt and Pepper, Jacin, to learn, to learn what, that's what they're listening to. While we're listening to Praise Station. <laughs> to get on the same page with them. That's, a, that's one way of engaging them and getting them involved in the conversation to bring about change. You know, one of, of course, one of the great accomplishments of your ministry is uh, the beauty of Trinity United Church of Christ. So what, what would you say uh, was the secret of Trinity United Church of Christ and its success in ministry? Um, I probably, would attribute, we used to ask new members to fill out cards and visitors in terms of what attracted you to this church, what, why do you, what do you like? As you, as you well know, when, when I retired, we had in excess of 20 weekly different Bible classes. People were saying, this is the first church I've been in where you can learn stuff. See, a lot of us have something on Wednesday night we call Bible class. It's a midweek service where the preacher tells you what the word says and you <laughs> take an offering, sing a prayer, and we're out of here. Where people had a textbook and they could grapple with and learn, learn how the Bible got put together. What does it say about white, black, Hispanic, Asian? What does it say about women in the Bible? That, that whole Christian education piece was one of the strongest, strongest reasons that I would, I would suggest that members themselves have said. Um, attributed to his group. And another cult is another cultural piece, two cultural pieces that I, I should not skip over in terms of, I just had a, a pastor stop me in the airport of Dallas today to tell me he had on his purple and his color, he's a bishop, and he was raving about Omoji Karamu, our Thanksgiving service. He said he had never been to a church that seen that. That cultural piece as, as well as what's the media, well, the same, the same phenomenon that is now being used by churches like yours, like Freddie's, like Otis's, in terms of social media and and IT, uh, tech sav tech savvy. Kenyatta Gilbert calls them not theologians but technologians. Um, for us, in, in my era, was the radio. We grew slowly until we went on the radio. 
when we went on the radio, here's the cultural piece and the Christian piece intertwined. People started calling the church. Why? Because they had never heard on the radio in Chicago. I ain't talking about Indianapolis. In Chicago, they had never heard throw down gospel music with sermons that made sense. <laughs> and they were, they were saying, what's the address of this church? Is this for real or Memorex? I mean, seriously, are y'all a real church? Because if you had, if you had well thought out students from Frank Thomas's homiletics classes delivering powerful, tight messages, they were in the Presbyterian, United Methodist, United, and the music was, <laughs> and when you hear, our God is awesome, come sermon time, hey, won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he, and then go to channel flipping, all right? That, that, they, that account of being on the radio is when we started going off the charts in terms of growth. Now that attracted people to church. Keeping them there was the educational piece and the opportunities for ministry. Now most churches, when I was growing up, so you walk down the aisle, I shake your hand, I say, uh, what's, your name? what's your name, brother? Thomas, where you wanna work? Well, the only thing you've seen is the urchers and the deacons. And the choir, you can't sing. <laughs> you don't know what the church does. So many opportunities for ministries, singles ministry, married couples ministry, 22 different youth programs, all kids can't sing, dance ministry, tennis. I mean, just the, the wide plethora of offerings is, is also something the members talked about in terms of this is the first church I belong to where I can do that. Okay. Thank you, sir. We have a couple um, special guests. We have... Um, Chief Rick Height of the Indianapolis Police Department, Chief. Yeah, yeah come on. Wait. And we also have uh, David Miller, who, uh, who, who wrote the, the 10 rules that we picked up from Trinity. Why don't both of y'all come? And, um, come on, y'all have a seat. I, I'll find another chair. And uh, you have a seat. We we would like to uh, give both of you a couple couple minutes. We ain't got long, but a couple minutes just to respond to all that you've heard. Anything that you'd like to? Thank you so much. Uh, I saw it in Trinity, and it was absolutely awesome. So thank you for your work. And um, why don't you give us just a brief bit about your ministry, and then tell us what you think. And Chief, we'll come to you next. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. My name is David Miller. Hail from the great uh, city of Baltimore, Maryland. Just wanna got an amen over there. <laughs> Currently reside in Washington D.C. And just just very quickly, um, part of the ten rules of survival was stopped by the police. Is is part of a much longer journey. Uh, growing up in Baltimore, there were a couple of things that happened to me growing up. One was meeting this brother. Um, I was probably in graduate school, and it was the first time that I really understood that police were not my natural enemy. I was in graduate school when I, when I realized that police were not my natural enemy because I met this brother when he was on the Baltimore police force, and he was actively working with gang members. He was actively doing innovative work in the community, doing things like helping gang members uh, do things like tattoo removal. I mean, literally taking gang members getting them places where they could get there was Crips or Bloods or Gangster Disciples, places where they could get things like tattoos removed. And so that was, that was major for me growing up. The second thing was a couple of encounters with the police. And then the third thing was when I was a freshman in college, I was at Morgan State. My best friend was at Morehouse. He was shot and killed standing next to me. And so it was a combination of all of those things that made me decide that I really wanted to become a change agent in, communi in the community. I was funded through the Open Society Foundation, and I actually wrote a curriculum called Dare to be King, What if the Prince Lives, a survival manual for African-American males. And so the 10 Rules of Survival was originally published in 2003 as both a teaching tool to work with young people and then also to work with law enforcement because part of the work is not just working with the young people but helping the police officers understand that we have, to think, we have to think and do things differently.
Doctor, doctor, thank you for allowing me to say a few words. He's right. I have not seen his brother in four or five years. And we walked the streets together early in the morning and late at night talking about the quality of life is direct proportion to commitment to God and to excellence. So as I look around the room, we committed to excellence, right? And as Dr. Wright has reminded us, we all have a fiduciary responsibility to police ourselves first. I became a police officer because I saw bad policing growing up. And rather than talk about it and use it in the street vernacular doc, it's about being about it and making a difference. And the challenge is, is to <laughs> convince people that you got to hold us accountable true. But we also have to hold each other accountable because I am like you when I'm not wearing this uniform. I'm no looked upon it no differently. I just happen to be the chief right now. But there are times when people don't recognize me and what is the contribution I have and don't know nothing about my history, my heritage, and what I've done. So I don't wear my pedigree on, on my forehead. But I do look like a professional victim if the people in the community don't recognize me as being someone worthwhile. So as we talked about the churches and the power the church has and how we as a community can come together, yeah, we have, but we need a church without walls. And we need to walk the street because our young people I talk to don't ask about denomination when they're out there trying to hit it, hit a lick. Then they're asking for voter cards and they're asking for a hand up, a hand out, they ask for a hand up. But then when they get rejected, and you're talking about people who are not used to asking, yeah, we worked on one-stop shops. We talked about how we bring people together so we can get everything they need in one place. We talked about how important it is to build trust among ourselves first before we go abroad. So if we don't trust each other in this room, how can we go outside the community and expect people to trust us? Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna give each of you uh, an opportunity to ask Dr. Wright a question that you'd like. You know, he, he's, he's a genius, so he's, you know, in, in <laughs> a, and then we'll, we'll move. So what question for the two of you all? Wow, I mean, that could take a couple of days, brother. Um, <laughs> I, I guess, and I know you touched upon it, um, how do we create churches and ministries that are really, really willing to engage young people in the community and not just young people who come based on relationships with their parents because there is a large subset of the community. The only time they go to church is for funerals, not even weddings anymore. A lot of times folk ain't getting married, and that's probably a separate lecture <laughs> in its own right. So, so how do we engage that population that has become disconnected from church and really don't necessarily have a working practical understanding of God. Brother Miller, you asked three different questions. <laughs> the first one had to do with the church and, and uh, that, trying to respond to that is almost a case by case scenario or response. Some churches are very willing to do that. Other churches are not. And it's not, well, and, for, and for lots of reasons. And how to change that mentality is, is an uphill battle. As I was sharing, I think earlier today, I was talking with the, yes I was, with Lisa about the AME ministers in Michigan. Some churches are family churches. And being a family church, they don't want nobody else in there. <laughs> but they family. So you start talking about kids from the neighborhood, kids, mm, mm, they didn't. They don't want lawyers and doctors who are not a part of their family. <laughs> Forget kids in the community. But then when, when you, you shift it from the local churches, and other churches will be most, most anxious to learn how to dialogue with the people in the community around, around the church. Um, so that's why I say it's a case by case. In terms of engaging that large pop population, um, one of the ways, one of the most positive and powerful ways that I have seen uh, work is through hip hop. Now, now, um, Freddie Haynes, Fred, you know Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III. His member is Ricky Smiley. So he closes out the Ricky Smiley show every day with a ten-minute sermonette addressed to the hip hop crowd who never heard of Jesus, nothing about Jesus, Lord, nothing. Good Lent. I lent you a dollar. You never gave me the money. <laughs> <laughs> Freddie addresses his message to them, 
And as a result of his addressing the hip hop crowd, uh, whose mothers and fathers did not grow up singing Amazing Grace, they grew up singing Nicki Minaj. You know, oh my God, look at her. Uh, uh, he has attracted a large number of them for the first time in their lives, 19, 20, 21, into the church because he engages them in a language they can speak. Uh, and, and that for me, what John Kenny said years ago is the way it, it applies for, for older people. I was just talking about it at, at uh, Eastern Star last month. It applies to the older folk my age and it applies to kids, my, my grandchildren's age. And that is what John Kenny, <laughs> Dr. John Kenny, when he came out of Union Theological Seminary with a dual PhD from Columbia and Union in philosophical theology, he was one of James Cone's students. He came out preaching black. We got to get these chains off our minds. We got to be black in our thinking and black in our hermeneutics and black in our homiletics and black and black and black and black. Had a dashiki on natural. And everybody, that was his first Sunday after church after getting his PhD, he, see, he tried to preach everything he learned in that PhD in one sermon. <laughs> <laughs> and he's in a country church. And the folk in the country church came through the door shaking his hand and said, how's Tina? Is Aaron coming home? Where's Dito? All questions about his family. Nobody said nothing about his sermon, <laughs> except one octogenarian on a walker. And she came up to him and she put her hand in his solar plexus. She says, boy, you got a fountain in there that's just bubbling. <laughs> and that fountain is going to quench the thirst of thousands, if not millions. I can, I can feel the spray when you talk. <laughs> she said, but if you want me to drink from your fountain next time, put it in a cup I can recognize. <laughs> And we got to put it in senior, we got to put the gospel in the cup to teenagers and the hip hops and millennials can recognize, otherwise they're not gonna drink. So I, I see that as how, how we engage that community. And that, like you said, going outside the walls. They ain't coming in, most of them ain't coming in, except for a few. Thank you, Doug, for that powerful message. And I guess my only question to follow up to David's is, we like to think we're problem oriented but and solution based, but how do we do that? Do you expound on this whole idea of mission versus ministry? That's a powerful concept. Yeah, we, we, we um, our church, I can tell you how, a, I can give you an answer, a answer, not a one size fits all answer. But what we did at our church was to change the notion of what do those people need? <laughs> like we missionaries. And we're going to lay on them something they need. They need a clothes closet. They need food. What, what do they need to making them our members? What do our members? See, the conversation changes just as you know, talking to, to the brothers in the gang. When you're sitting at the table with them, talking with them as human beings, not as objects of mission, uh, but, but, but making, making persons of all. We used to call ourselves the, the uh, alphabet soup church because we had all the alphabets. Bachelor of Arts, BA, Bachelor of Science, BS, MS, PhD, DD, MD, DDS, ADC. You know what ADC is? Aid to Dependent Children. <laughs> Welfare. Because we taught that the letters behind your name have nothing to do with the church. They have to do with how you make a living. The church has to do with how you make a life. So you start having uh, sitting on the same board a Blaine Deny, PhD, and a, and a principal of a high school, Manfred Bird, superintendent of schools, Sam Allen High School graduate, Tuck Pointer, on the same board as equals. That, that, that kind of changing the notion of we, we're speaking down to you as we speak in brother to brother, sister to brother, that, that, um, that worked for us. That worked for us. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, put your hands together and thank all of, thank all of our, our panelists. Thank you. Y'all can come on, come on down. Come on, thank our panelists. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Bishop, when you have a seat over there, thank you, Bishop. Uh, we got a couple more things to do, and we'll have you out of here. We're, we're really on schedule and on time. So we just want to uh, remind you of a couple things. Um, um, Ray, would you put a couple of them on the screen so I can be reminded of what I'm supposed to be talking about? 
Um, number one, uh, we, uh, we have a, a, um, a survey that we would like for you to take. Uh, I think it's in your bulletin, uh, your program as well. Please respond to us and allow us, give us some feedback so that we can evaluate. Uh, we think that we're doing a, a fabulous job, but we would like to hear from you because our desire is to serve you and make these kind of events uh, places that you would like to be. Um, so um, it'll be coming up. Is it in, in the bulletin? It's not there? Uh, it's coming up. Um, I need to, we already thank David Miller. Um, thank you, sir, for your wonderful ministry. We thank the chief um, and we thank Liz. Any other uh, important folks we got that we need to introduce? Everybody, huh? <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, yes. Okay. We have a, a set of the original uh, Ten Rules poster out in the lobby um, that you can purchase. They'll be, uh, I'll be out in the lobby. Liz, why don't you open one? I know they can't get a shot necessarily. Why don't you open one? Um, I had a list of things. If you're interested, uh, the Desmond Tutu Center has a table. Um, we're also having an event um, called the DNA Experience. It's in your bulletin. Renita Weems will be here. And uh, she will, you can get more information out at the table, please. And if anybody is interested in information about Christian Theological Seminary, uh, we really are a wonderful place and a wonderful school. And uh, we are engaged in a sacred conversation on race, on violence, and human dignity. And if you feel something twitching in your spirit that you want to be a part, uh, this is the poster. This is what I saw in the Bulletin of Trinity, United Church of Christ, that I brought home and ended up being the, the video. This is designed by David Miller, and it will be for sale if you'd like a copy of it. Uh, we're going to give uh, Dr. Wright a copy as uh, our special guest. It was yours, sir. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bolton. Um, your feedback is important to us. It's on the back of this. Did y'all see this? Your feedback is important to us. It helps us improve our events. Please take our online survey at www.ctsedu back survey. Survey the DNA experiences under it. And is there anything else? I know I'm missing something, but um, we are um, we're going to conclude by some singing together before we go home. Uh, we're going to go back to I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. And we're going to bring uh, Ricky McCray uh, to sing. He is our choir director at CTS. Um, he's also a prominent pastor. If you're looking for a great church, um, why don't you tell him the name of your church and then hit it. <laughs> I am uh, the pastor of the Way Church, and I just want everybody to just stand to your feet. Just stand to your feet. We've been sitting for a while. We're going to sing this. Walk with me, Lord. Come on, clap your hands. Walk with me. Walk with me. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. Walk with me. While I'm on, while I'm on this pilg pilgrim journey. Come on, say, I want Jesus, I want Jesus to walk with me. Come on, say this, be my friend, Lord. Be my friend, Lord. Come on, say, be my friend. Oh, be my friend, Lord, my friend, Lord, be my friend. While I'm on this, on this pilgrim journey, journey, I want Jesus, Jesus, to walk with me. 
Come on, say this last one. Hold my hand. Hold my hand, Lord. Hold my hand. Hold my hand. Come on, if you want them to hold your hand. Hold my hand, Lord. Hold my hand. While I'm on, on this pilgrim journey, I want Jesus, I want Jesus to walk with me. One more, one more before we go. Tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright Jr. will be lecturing on 70 years of black preaching. And then at 1130, he will be preaching. He is our father and our bishop, so he can preach as long as he wants to. That's the answer. Amen. Amen. So we're going to ask Ricky to offer us a word of prayer as our benediction. And thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you for your time, especially in this weather. God bless you. Let us pray. Gracious Father God, we thank you, God, for what we have heard today. We pray, God, that we will rest in that place of surgery. Lord, being comfortable, Lord, just being in the pain before we rush to the healing. We pray, God, that we will allow you, Lord, to reconstruct our hearts before we rush to healing. We pray, God, that today you will help us to remember, Lord, to love our neighbors, God, as you have loved us. We pray also, Lord, that you will help us to be agents of change, that we won't just talk about it, but, God, that we will be about it. Allow us, Lord, to make it home safely to our places, God of destination. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.